This is the West Virginia Public Television Network. highways and black lung benefits. Jennings Randolph served in the U.S. Senate for longer than any West Virginian. He's been part of the Washington scene for a historic half century. Yes, we passed 15 measures in that first 100 days. Think of it. Today, we'll spend two days on an amendment. Family and friends, colleagues and critics, and Jennings himself look back on a life in politics. I so often think, and I talk to people about it, uh, this capital couldn't be here if people hadn't been at work and paying taxes. That's the only way we can build anything. And when people are not working, that's when the country is in difficulty. It's not statistics. It's not building. It's not programs or projects. It all comes back to people. Few members of the United States Congress have touched the lives of as many people as the gentleman from West Virginia. But then, few have served for as many years on as many committees, won and lost, and come back to pursue as wide a range of measures. This is an opening statement. This year, I made some changes. Yes, they've been incorporated in here, which is why it's sort of cut and pasted. It's all right. It's okay. Randolph has lost the people. He's this courtly... Uh, very uh, kind and courteous man, and he's rich and earthy and uh, and real and uh, with great good humor. I don't think there's anyone in this place, Democrat or Republican or like, that is more respected for his fairness and courtly kindness. For the Senate sensation and the hearing to be held. Over and over again, we will find witnesses who come at their own expense, who come before this committee. An amendment is offered to pending legislation. Uh, we rush out and leave the witnesses sitting. I've seen it's that over and over. a modern, again. older man. I mean, think about it. Jennings Randolph, the fellow who started the airmail service in this country. Jennings Randolph is the fellow who started the major legislative effort to treat the handicapped with some degree of dignity. Jennings, you can go down the list of things, and Jennings hasn't been like some successful people in politics, and that is clung to his old initiative. Jennings ran off the guy, the 18-year-old vote. I mean, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't some young United States Senator like Joe Biden, it was Jennings Randolph. The handicapped people, the blind people, the depressed farmers and miners, I think that any, any group that has had a, had a worthy cause has always found in him a supporter. And uh, he has not represented the big business interests and the great corporations. Merely by standing still and staying as he was 20 years ago, he becomes more prominent in his concern for the public because there are so many uh, crass and, and uh, insensitive new senators uh, around him. He's been called the last of the New Deal Democrats, and of all the politicians who came to Washington with Franklin D. Roosevelt, he would be the last to leave. But political observers have a difficult time sticking a label on him. He's conservative on many social issues and foreign policy, liberal on economic matters and the role of government. There are some people who say the less government, the better. Oh, that can't be because populations increase. How are you going to increase? from the time I came here, when there were a hundred million less people in the country than there are today, how can you, let's say, provide for that greater population? His philosophy has been nurtured and tested over a long period of time. When he first entered politics, Jennings Randolph's father advised his son to always remember the man and the woman by the wayside of the road. It became his motto in Washington and in West Virginia. Half a century later, the roads are different, the men and women have changed. But at age 82, in his concluding year in the Senate, 
Jennings Randolph hasn't driving. slowed down. Not He's one of those you. responsible for making our line. world move faster. There's a difference. There's As we ride along with him now, we'll visit it's many of the scenes of his life's different. journey from the house in Salem, West Virginia, where he was born. It now belongs to Salem College and would be moved onto the campus to house his personal papers. Hey. To his apartment at the Tigert Hotel in Elkins, his legal residence in West Virginia, where an old trunk, rediscovered and reopened after many years, contains the props of his life's adventure. But right now, he's going to see some constituents for what we all expected would be a quick and quiet personal visit. We're going where I made my first political speech and running for office. That was 1930. And I made it here at Brownson. I had dear friends there. It's in Barber County. This is right here. Yes, sir. Uh, this is it. Oh, <laughs> here I'm seeing people I haven't seen for a long time. Oh, <laughs> gosh. This is wonderful. Oh, yeah. Gosh, how long has it been? Oh, it's quite a time. Oh, yes, it's great. We're still on the run. Aren't we? <laughs> I'm glad I can be right here. Okay, yes. Uh, Hello. 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 Why did you come here to deliver your first speech? Because of Virginia and the Radcliffe family and other friends. And that's why we came here. People again. We've been talking about people. Yes, indeed. Well, I've wrote him a couple letters concerning Black Run and Pensioners, and he's always, yeah. he's been right there to answer the questions. And yeah. He never did turn nobody down from walking in his office or nothing. So. Yeah. But they had some more men like them to vote in the Senate and Congress, too. We'd have had a different way to go, you know, I believe. All right, thank you. Pardon me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You know, this doesn't have to be a monumental room for me to love it. The best word in the world is that word welcome, isn't it? We're here together, and that's what counts. Senator, do you remember exactly what you said in this hall when you delivered your first speech here, what the exact words were? I said, please give me a chance to go to <laughs> That's what I said. The future was as murky as the meeting room for those people in Brownsville 54 right, years so. ago. But, but Jennings Randolph's background was already impressive, late. and what came Who before would have a lot to do with what followed. Prominent. His but story I mean, is as much the story of a family as it is of a state or a political party. To tell that part, the senator's son, sportscaster Jay Randolph. The Randolphs of West Virginia are not the same family as the Randolphs from east of the mountains. Randolph County, West Virginia, was named for the first United States Attorney General, Edmund Randolph. He members of the Seventh-day Baptist Church. The family's history in West Virginia goes back to one Samuel Fitz Randolph, who bought some land in what was then called New Salem, Virginia, just after the American Revolution. It was Samuel who laid out the first street plan in the town of Salem. His great-grandson, Jesse, became the first elected mayor of the town, one of the founders of Salem College, a Seventh-day Baptist institution, and president of the college. Jesse's son, Ernest, was graduated from Salem in 1894. He took a law degree at West Virginia University and returned home to open a law office. In 1896, Ernest married a neighbor, 17-year-old Idell Bingman. Their first child, a daughter, was born in 1899 and named Ernestine after her father. The second child was a boy, born on March 8, 1902. And the doctor came along, and he says, Ernestine, I just brought you a new little brother. Do you want him? If you don't, well, t I'll take him home with me. And uh, I, I kind of remember, but Dr. Sam said, I said, oh, I guess we'll keep him. <laughs> Since Ernestine had been named for her father, the Randolphs decided to name their son after a family friend. Then Brian said, uh, well, when Papa said we're going to have another baby, he said, well, you want a boy? He said, yes, I don't. I think we're going to have a boy this time. He said, a Democratic boy. And Papa said, yes. He said, why don't you give him part of my name? 
William Jennings Bryan was three-time Democratic nominee for president. They called him the great commoner, a brilliant orator and champion of reform. Bryan is considered by many historians to have been the creator of the modern Democratic Party. He carried into mainstream politics the principles of rural populism supported by people like Jesse and Ernest Randolph. What kind of man was William Jennings Bryan? Just, uh, just as friendly as could be and just like one of you. I couldn't tell any difference. We didn't look at him. I, I never thought, oh my goodness, this is William Jennings Bryan. Uh, he had a tremendous appeal. My, my, you, you read something, as I've said, and you said, yes, that's good. But when you heard him speak, why, well, the lights went on. He, in a sense, was a church man, and I don't mean to indicate that I'm just a church man, but he had certain values that I believed in. I can never remember when we weren't involved. Never. It's just one hassle after the other. Well, we couldn't have had a better family life. We discussed the matters that should be discussed today at the table. They aren't discussed today. Well, the responsibilities of citizenship. We don't hear that in the home today. But politics was more than just a topic of dinner table conversation. When Ernest Randolph was chosen as a delegate to the Democratic National Convention held in Baltimore in 1912, he took the whole family along. I was 10 years old and I sat on the knee of my father. But I can still, you know, see the loving, hear the band being the blue cup. Gee, we had our lunch with us every day. We went every day. I, I think it was good for me to be there. And I, I didn't understand all that was taking place. I thought it was tough to me and talking about it. Was there any suggestion that maybe this was a little too rough for a young child to encounter? No, no, no. So Jennings Randolph was on hand to witness the nomination of Woodrow Wilson. And soon he would find himself personally involved in politicking when his father ran for election to Congress. Fourteen-year-old Jennings was at his side. Jennings said this much. Uh, speech making as your dad did. I would go with my father into a place like Webster County, which was a part of the district, and uh, we would ride on the narrow gauge railroad uh, across from Holly Junction to Webster Springs. Well, he'd say, you know, I'm Ernest Randolph, and I want to serve you in Congress, and I hope you can support me. He really loved people, and he called himself the People's candidate. Ernest Randolph ran for Congress and lost twice, a Democrat in what was then a heavily Republican district. Jennings' early exposure to politics may have been extraordinary, but otherwise he enjoyed a typical boyhood in early 20th century West Virginia. Salem was a busy place in those days, a college town with a thriving glass industry employing some 500 Belgian-born glass workers and there was plenty to keep a growing youngster busy. I worked everywhere around here, you know. I worked, I, I carried the, the water when they were putting the bricks in. We didn't have cement and, and uh, asphalt. We put bricks in originally here. And I think I made 40 cents a day, I don't know, but I worked long hours. Occasionally we'd go to Nickelodeon to a show and we made our own. Uh, Activities. Gene Lowther has been a close friend since the fourth grade. We played uh, with those boys and girls in our own neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Jennings and I lived about a quarter of a mile apart. We never played together. That was all. far away. Yeah, we were a long way. Most of Jennings Randolph's formal education came from one institution. Salem Academy was a primary and secondary school run by Salem College. Jennings was graduated from one and enrolled in the other in 1920. Most of us were training to be teachers. Jennings wasn't. And uh, there was no college politics in those days to speak of at all. Uh, he did ex exceptionally well in the, uh, in the debating team. He could talk of a managed subject at any time. Jennings never lacked for a date when he was in college, I might add. I think that's complimentary. Mary Ann, you agree to that? I agree to that. He loved her. He never lacked for a date. If we could get the Carsburg one, mm -hmm. that, was, that was really something. Yeah. An arm injury kept Jenks Randolph from playing college football, but he did star for the Salem tennis and basketball team. His specialty was the old underhanded foul shot. 
1922, while still in college, Jennings was named secretary treasurer of the Randolph Oil and Gas Company, founded by his father. They drilled over a hundred wells in Harrison and Doddridge counties, mostly dry holes. His college career was more successful. In his junior year, Jennings Randolph was elected to the Salem College Board of Trustees, a position he would hold for over 50 years. He graduated in 1924 in the same class as another U.S. Senator from West Virginia, Rush Holt. The first full-time job after graduation was with the Clarksburg Telegram, officially a sports editor, but writing about everything with a good feel for human interest stories. During the summer of 24, he went to New York City to cover the Democratic National Convention, and so was present when, on the 103rd ballot, the nomination went to an old family friend from West Virginia. It's still considered the biggest day Clarksburg ever had when favorite son John W. Davis came back to formally accept the presidential nomination in August of 1924. John W. Davis, the former member of Congress, the Lister General of the United States, our ambassador to the Court of St. James, the biggest one we have. There's never been a lawyer that's practiced before the Supreme Court that had the ability of John W. Davis. But his Wall Street connections earned him the opposition of William Jennings Bryan. Unlike the 1912 convention, Jennings Randolph now understood fully what was going on. He had gone for Davis. But it's when his brother was vice presidential candidate. Few people know that, you know, really. Anyone listening to this program will never know how Charles W. Bryan came aboard, but I do know. Let me just take you back so, a week or so prior to uh, John W. Davis uh, coming, coming back home because yes. uh, William Jennings Bryan came through town and you went out to cover him. And well, he came back to speak. There was a group of five that decided because of his connection with John W. Davis fighting him and then not fighting him and being with him at the last, they thought he would draw a great crowd in Clarksburg. And then they hired the Carmichael Auditorium and uh, they gave him $500 if he would come and speak about that uh, election and John W. Davis and so forth and so on. And he came and they had 250 some paid admissions they lost. I think uh, twelve hundred dollars. How did that make you feel? Here is this man who was once such a great national figure, and he couldn't even fill Carmichael Auditorium. Well, that's politics, the same, you know, up and down, up and down. Davis lost the presidential race to Calvin Coolidge and the prosperity of the twenty. His biggest disappointment was that he didn't even carry the state of West Virginia. Jennings Randolph continued his writing career as the associate editor of Bill Conley's West Virginia Review. And in 1926, the young man from Salem moved to Elkins to teach journalism and public speaking and to become the athletic director at Davis and Elkins College. As the boom years of the 20s came to an end, Jennings Randolph was an ambitious and hopeful young man with a good reputation as a writer, teacher, even a sports hero, bearing a familiar name and filled with energy. And in 1930, he set out to get elected to Congress from West Virginia's 2nd District. He never considered any other office. From 29, we went down in this country after the crash. The crash wasn't just felt, we'll say, back in Elkins or Martinsburg or Morgantown or Kaiser in the way it was on Wall Street. We know that. But uh, that was uh, a dramatic downdraft uh, among all of this country. And so we didn't reach it in its, uh, let's say, disaster features, as did certain great cities and all of that. But the impact was there in the state of West Virginia. And it was in the district that I wanted to represent that I felt it and understood it. He was determined he was going to do it, whether he had any money or not, he was going to do it. I, I stress the fact that I, I was the candidate of the people, and uh, that was on my <laughs> advertising. He lost by a narrow margin to incumbent Republican Congressman Frank Bowman. The only reason that I feel 
he was not elected in the for the in the first term was the fact. Abel White of Morgantown was one of Jennings Randolph's uh, first uh, campaign Thomas workers. Bowman was an older man and had had experience. Jennings was very young, and uh, I think it was just reluctance on the part of the people to, in view of the situation of the economy at that time and what was going on, to change. And did, did you yourself feel any problems because of the Depression, because of the economic difficulties? Were you worried at all about your own future, your own well-being? No, I don't recall that I was worried. I had no money, really. My father had had problems in the oil and gas uh, business and had lost money. And uh, at that time, he uh, was really in debt. In December of 1931, Ernest Randolph died suddenly. And Jennings was more determined than ever that he was going to really do it. Well, he did. He wanted to finish something yes, that, 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 that my father hadn't, hadn't done. Yeah. 1932, this time with a strong national ticket at the top of the ballot and with ample time off for campaigning granted by Davis and Elkins College, Jennings Randolph launched his second try for Congress. He'd already enhanced his reputation by being chosen district governor of the West Virginia Lions Club. And he showed his electoral clout by winning a hard-fought primary against Joseph Gibson of Kingwood. He had the endorsement of all the counties, except Randolph County and the Democratic Executive Committee, but he, he didn't know the people. And that's where I, for years and years, had been going uh, to the uh, box socials, <laughs> to the family reunions. I was among people and meeting people and working with people. And, of course, I was only 28, and he was uh, an established a lawyer and a fine gentleman and later became the attorney from the Northern District of West Virginia. But he found that wasn't enough. There was another important event at the same time. Jennings Randolph first met Mary Catherine Babb when he stayed at her family's home in Kaiser during a Salem College tennis match against Potomac State. Her father was mayor of Kaiser and incidentally a Republican. Mary was a state welfare worker during the time she and Jennings carried on a long distance courtship. Their wedding took place in Kaiser on February 18, 1933. Then Jennings and Mary piled their belongings into Mary's two-door Ford. Jennings had sold his car for campaign funds. And together, they were off to Washington. According to time-honored custom, the retiring president and the president-elect ride together from the White House with congressional escort down the long and proud-packed Pennsylvania Avenue to the Capitol, where Roosevelt is to take the oath of office. Enthusiasm is at its height. Never was it... It was uh, uh, not a sunny day, uh, but while he spoke, uh, the weather brightened and the skies cleared. And I thought that was an omen, perhaps, uh, and uh, we talked about that as we uh, left Capitol Hill. And I remember so very well, I said to Mary, do you think that he can do this job and turn America around and turn it up, perhaps? She said, I, I, I feel if anyone can do it, he can. So first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. What book were people afraid of? Well, they were frightened, uh, really, that uh, they were to have jobs. We realized that the unemployment figure nationwide was well over 20%. It's a time when there were tens and tens of thousands of men, especially, riding the trains without payment. They were in the boxcars, running up and down and across the Baltimore and Ohio railroad or whatever the railroad hoping to jump off at a certain place and maybe find a job and if they couldn't they'd get on and go somewhere else and back home why the mother and two or three children were trying to hold the family together it was a dislocation across america a disillusionment almost a, a desperate time in this country and you felt it it seemed to push in against you in those days but i I never lost the, the feeling that America uh, could come out of that. Uh, and certainly, 
FDR, of the nine presidents for whom and with I've served, why he was the right man at the right place at the right time. Our first task is to reopen all sound banks. Uh, most of that uh, New Deal legislation was passed by overwhelming majority. Take the Emergency Banking Act uh, on the 9th of March, the first day. There was not a dissenting vote in the House of Representatives. In the Senate, the vote was 73 to 7. To be in sound condition. Yes, we passed 15 measures in that first 100 days. Think of it. Today, we'll spend two days on an amendment in the Senate to a bill. Just one amendment debating it. Yes. We passed that uh, collective bargaining <laughs> about a couple of hours, I think. Was that within two past? Do you think it was a steamroller in that first time? Well, I don't think so. Uh, it might sound like it now. But, but in those days, at least those first few weeks and months, there was a feeling that we, we just had to work together. And he was able to, uh, to have the Congress, and the members, both Republican and Democrat, realize that fact. He had uh, members of the House who were elected as well as the Senate in 32. And I was in the group of seven called in the latter part of March. I believe it was 19th or 20th, if I could, but that's near enough. And uh, that night we went to the White House by uh, his request. And uh, it was a rainy, dreary, cold night in Washington. We were taken to the second floor of the White House. And the president was sitting behind a large desk and we filed by and shook hands with him then a semicircle and we sat there and uh, I can recall he smiled and he said you know I'd like to tell stories tonight joke with you but I can't do it uh, we, we've got to talk about some matters that uh, we must uh, take action on very shortly and he began to unfold some of these programs and talk about them not just in specifics but in a philosophical way to a degree and one of our members long since gone from the Middle West I recall what he said to the president, Mr. President, I want to support you in these programs and projects, but I think you're trying to do it too quickly. I don't think the people can uh, digest all of this that you're talking about in the short period of time that you're indicating, a matter of days or weeks. I don't think they can do it. And the president didn't have any response. He didn't frown, he didn't smile, he just was talking. And then he read a little memo, I can still see it on the desk, and then he took his glasses and laid them down. He seemed to move into his desk, although, as you know, he could not walk, but he could pull himself into that desk, a large desk. And he didn't look at the one man that had questioned his timing. He looked at all of us, and he said, but gentlemen, do you realize we must act now? By acting now, we will assuredly, and I never shall forget that word, we will assuredly make mistakes. But I'm afraid that if we do not act now, just a little later, we will not even be given the time to make the mistakes. Well, that's serious talk. In a program which covers the entire nation, West Virginia takes an important place. The construction of the Tri-County Airport at Clarksburg is an excellent example of a project which serves the community in three ways by improving transportation facilities, by relieving local unemployment, and by increasing property values. Through the work of Congressman Randolph and other members of the state's delegation in Washington, West Virginia received a generous share of federal funds from the Works Progress Administration, the Civilian Conservation Corps, and other agencies. Morgantown, where a retaining wall is being built to prevent an important traffic thoroughfare. West Virginia also gained some special attention. That was when I first met Mrs. Roosevelt, that's why she said Congressman Randolph at that point, had called me and asked me to assist her in any way I could in getting to the coal camps and uh, seeing the situation there, which I did. Did you try in any way to clean up what was going on in there, or did you want them to see the worst situation? Oh no, it was the worst situation. Just, well, no one knew she was coming. When you would uh, tell them who she was, they couldn't believe it. Yes, it was just a shock. They were shocked, and of course, they had lived in those conditions for so long that they uh, didn't think it could ever be changed. When Mrs. Roosevelt began developing the Arthurdale situation here, it was Sue Senator Randolph 
efforts that that was ever done in the first place. Newly constructed resettlement communities here at Arthurdale and at Bailey and Eleanor were among the Roosevelt administration's most ambitious efforts to achieve economic progress by building from the bottom up. If you really want to know what, this, what the breed is, this is what they call a West Virginia moose. <laughs> Think of Franklin Roosevelt coming into a rural community and, and addressing a high school commencement. You know, you don't get that, you know. He, he was out and for the people. And generally, I think most of the West Virginia delegation generally supported President Roosevelt. Um, was there, in fact, a sort of pattern of, of, of rewards for your support in some of the projects when they had come to the state, or um, things like the resettlement project? Uh, more likely to happen in West Virginia than, let's say, in Maine, which would not be a good democratic state. I expect that that uh, is uh, a statement that uh, you've made it, but I, I think it's one that I could back up in degree. Mm -hmm. he, he wasn't... Uh, he wasn't adverse to helping those that were helping him. January 30th, 1982. A conservative Republican administration was now in office. On the 100th anniversary of the birth of FDR, Jennings Randolph addressed an extraordinary joint session of Congress. Now the New Deal brought hope where there was despair. It brought work where there was unwanted idleness. It brought unity and purpose where there was national chaos and much confusion. The legislative reforms of the New Deal, I stress this, in banking and finance, in agriculture and conservation practices, in eliminating sweatshops and child labor, enabling working men and women to organize for collective bargaining, in creating some measure of security for the elderly, in harnessing our rivers and generating electricity, that electricity going to farm and city homes alike. These reforms have changed the face of America and have been woven into the fabric of American life, and they will not be torn out. One sign of an effective politician is the ability to advance your own agenda and, if possible, get your name attached to a popular piece of legislation. Congressman Randolph achieved that in 1936 with a bill to provide employment for the handicapped, the randolph Shepard Act. I believe that the blind could be taken out of the dark corners of life and they themselves could be self-supporting. I went to Mr. Shepard, who was a senator from Texas, and asked him if he would co-sponsor it with me. I did that because he was a member of Lions International, and that was the service club that helped the blind. And then this legislation, which passed and signed by Franklin Roosevelt, who was handicapped himself. The I, effects I of Randolph Shepard are felt equally in all parts of the nation, not just West Virginia. Another national issue of personal concern during Jennings Randolph's years in Washington has been aviation. Randolph sponsored much of the important aviation legislation of the past half century. But in West Virginia, your constituents also expect you to be concerned with activity underground. In 1943, Jennings Randolph demonstrated his interest in both coal and aviation when he flew from Morgantown to Washington in a plane powered by synthetic aviation fuel made from coal. The pilot was Arthur Hyde of Moorfield. On November 6, 1983, 40 years later to the day, Senator Randolph returned to the same airfield and to an identical Fairchild F-24. We had 42 gallons back in... 1943. Today we've got about a half quart, I think. <laughs> Shows what's happened. Shows what's happened. The trouble is today, I'm sad, of course, that the country did not go ahead with the development of alternate fuels because OPEC hit us once and OPEC or someone else can hit us again and we need the alternate fuels. Maybe this will help to regenerate perhaps the interest and concern and even the commitment in this country to do something in this field.
In 1943, of course, the worry was not simply over the source of our oil supply. World War II challenged the human and natural resources of a nation that had already been called to action in support of the New Deal. But national unity was hard to find, even for FDR. Six months before Pearl Harbor, the nation barely managed to enact the first peacetime draft in its history. Both Randolph and his good friend, former West Virginia Congressman Carter Manasco, remembered that vote as one of the roughest of their careers. As I look back, I sometimes muse about, you know, that night of 203 to 202. You were accused of casting. I was accused. Everybody yeah. voted. <laughs> With the 203 was the yeah. vote. <laughs> and uh, when I look back how ill-prepared our country was, the, our country could have been at war for years and years, and it would have cost us millions of lives. So I think that we can look back with pride. That probably our one vote saved the country. Yeah. yeah. Jennings was now in his 40s. He and Mary were the parents of two sons, Jay and Frank. Congressman Randolph served as chairman of the House District of Columbia Committee, an influential position in the days before the district gained home rule. Jennings and Mary played the role of mayor and first lady of the nation's capital city. In 1946, responding to a poll by Pageant Magazine, members of Congress chose West Virginia's Randolph as the member who had done the most for his district. But by then, the war was over, the Roosevelt administration had passed into history, and Representative Randolph was turned out, defeated by Republican Melvin Snyder. He lost because uh, Colonel Snyder had uh, just returned from the service a war hero. Jennings was working probably harder than he was working right here with the people. However, he came back a hero, and uh, he had nothing to be ashamed of Jennings losing that time. Well, he always said it was an off-year election. And although he led the ticket, he still lost. It was a bad year for the Democrats all the way around. It was not an easy loss for my dad after 14 years in the House, but he took it very well. I had a thank you that I paid for in all of the newspapers of the district, in which I thank people for the opportunity to have been the member of the House for 14 years. And I, I said that I would not be a candidate for re-election to the House of Representatives but that uh, I hope that sometime in my uh, life I might uh, be a candidate for the United States uh, Senate and serve the people of West Virginia as a whole. Jennings Randolph shipped his trunk home and entered the private sector, going to work as the assistant of the president of Capital Airways, doing public relations and some lobbying. He also kept his hand in West Virginia politics, getting chosen as a delegate to several Democratic national conventions. During that period, did he talk about wanting to get back in? Oh, my, yes. He, he, this was it. Well, I think he was always planning to run for the United States Senate. And when Senator Neely passed away, Dad was ready. He had kept his fences mended. He knew where he was headed. And, of course, he wanted that senior senator's seat. The opportunity came in 1958, the year West Virginia chose two United States senators. Democrat Matthew M. Neely, a major power in West Virginia politics since the 20s, had died in January. Governor Cecil Underwood, a Republican, had appointed John Hoblitzel to fill the seat until a special election could be held to finish the remaining years of Neely's term. Meanwhile, the term of Republican Chapman Revercombe was expiring. Republicans Revercombe and Hoblitzel were opposed by Democratic Congressman Robert C. Byrd and former Congressman Jennings Randolph. Uh, my election was not very tough, I don't think, that year. Uh, there was a recession, and um, it was the um, Eisenhower recession. So I think that helped us both. Jennings was a good campaigner. Uh, I wanted to see him win. Hoblet, so let's say he was an appointee. He hadn't had to go out and stand before the people, you know. Rebercombe had because he'd been a member. When you appointed Mr. Hoblitzel to the Senate, did you have any idea that Randolph is the one who was going to run against him? Uh, I wasn't sure, but I, I, it was a good bet that he would. Mm -hmm. Nobody tried to 
tag a carpetbagger image onto him because he hadn't been living in Washington all those years. Well, that issue was raised uh, frequently, but he maintained uh, residence in Elkins all those years, and uh, I, don't think, uh, I don't think that was a, an effective issue at all. Byrd and Randolph were elected by almost identical margins. Since he was filling a vacancy held by interim appointment, however, Jennings Randolph became a senator immediately after the votes were counted. When the next Congress convened, he was already senior senator from West Virginia. He would hold that rank for 26 years on a seniority of merely eight weeks. But it was like being back in the House of Representatives, another election two years later. This time, though, it was a presidential year, 1960, and one of the most extraordinary primary races in the nation's history was happening in West Virginia. I was four in the primary in West Virginia. Yeah, and yes, you, you counseled him on yeah. running in West Virginia. Yes, uh, I told him I believed that there would be a state where the test would be made. You see, we were, well, we were predominantly a Protestant state. That's understandably so, in a sense. Uh, but uh, I thought it would be the kind of state in which he might make a case uh, for the fact that we shouldn't vote for a person because he's a Protestant or against a person because he's a Catholic. We should vote for the man himself and what we stand for and that which he was. Were, were you concerned that there might be anti-Catholic sentiment in the state of West Virginia? Well, it was there to a degree, but I don't want to be misunderstood and say that uh, it was only those that were uh, in that uh, spirit uh, because uh, Humphrey was worthy as a candidate, you know, for president. I like Hubert Humphrey. Senator Ch Kennedy valued Jennings Randolph's help a great deal, I'm sure. Do you think that Senator Randolph made Senator Kennedy more acceptable to the people of West Virginia? Because Definitely. They say there was a religious issue which yes, he was attacking. because here. of the religious issue. There are many people who say it was West Virginia who actually cleared the way for John Kennedy to become president. Well, I think it, it, he made the breakthrough there. Yes. Yes, because people thought of West Virginia as rather hide brown, hide bound. I don't mean that in the wrong way, but it was a Protestant state. And in those days, it wasn't thought the Catholic could do too well. You know, Alfred E. Smith had that problem in uh, trying to be the president, uh, you know, when he was running in 1924, as you'll recall, against William G. McAdoo at the Democratic Convention. New Deal Democrats like Eleanor Roosevelt came back to help their old colleague. This time, Cecil Underwood himself took the standard for the Republicans. I was very close to the Eisenhower White House, and I had great pressure from them to run for the United States Senate. And so it just happened that Senator Randolph and I, though we were good friends, uh, were both looking at the same office. I get the impression you really didn't relish running against Jennings Randolph. No, he, uh, he in effect, was Mr. Salem College, and I graduated from Salem College. And in the years since that, we've both been on the board at uh, Salem and uh, have been close personal friends. So as far as being eager to get him or get at him, no, there was none of that element at all. Senator Randolph won a full six-year term and the benefits of being on the winning side. Because of what West Virginia did for John F. Kennedy, do you think the state was rewarded in any way? Well, he took an interest in helping us with our road development, personal interest. Mm -hmm. The North-South Road today we call I-79. Yeah, well, you, by a personal interest, what do you, how do you mean? Well, he interested himself in discussing that road oh, okay. across the state with us. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed he did. Under Randolph's sponsorship, the Interstate Highway Act was changed to allow an interstate highway to terminate in a city the size of Charleston. Call this afternoon, I suppose, what, to Riley or to Mrs. Dole? Throughout all his years in Washington, Randolph cultivated the ability to move projects up the ladder of priorities. His committee assignments gave him leverage, 42 years on labor and education committees, also on the Veterans Affairs and Human Resources committees. But at the center of his power was the Public Works Committee, which he chaired and which was broadened into the Committee on Environment and Public Works. 
In that position, he had to deal with some of the most complex and often emotional issues the nation was facing. When I became a member of the Congress, and that was 51 years ago, we did not speak in terms of ecology or the environment. The earliest environmental programs were those related to our conservation efforts. It would open him to charges that, on the one hand, the old New Dealer was still thinking in terms of costly federal programs, and on the other, that he was sometimes too willing to accommodate corporate interests. Critics said he came late to the Black Lung Bill, or that he tried to advance the industry viewpoint on coal mine health and safety. One of those who tangled with him was citizen advocate Ralph Nader. On some issues, he was a tool of the coal industry. And it was only when public opinion and power turned against the coal industry decisively that he sided with the people. That was the case with the coal mine safety bill and black lung programs. And I think that that is, uh, in a way, an indirect tribute to him. Uh, at least he changed. And in that sense, Jennings Randolph uh, showed that he had a capacity for growth. It might have been partially pragmatic, but it might have been also a realization that after all, uh, this country is for the powerless, not just for the powerful. He doesn't uh, like to be disliked. He's not a combative person. He likes to be liked. But I always thought that he never used uh, very much of the power that he had in the Senate, uh, given his seniority and given the kind of power that Robert Byrd uh, has used in the Senate. I've from time to time gotten on other people's toes and feelings. A majority, a majority leader is going to do that, or a minority leader. But I'd rather be respected than loved if I have to pick one or the other. There's no reason why one can't be loved and respected. But there's, there's no person in this body who is genuinely loved more than is Jennings Randolph. I would say he's never made an enemy here. And uh, we all admire him for that. When Jennings leaves the Senate, we're going to miss him. Jennings would decide to throw his weight around. Uh, he, he would gather up uh, an interesting array of supporters who would just come to his side automatically on an issue. That was the toughest thing for me to deal with when I would be opposing him, is that someone uh, uh, who well, I respected on either side of the aisle would say, I, you know, I'd like to help you, but Jennings has talked to me. When you talk about handicap, when you talk about education, when you talk about black lung, when you talk about hospital care benefits, when you talk about the things that are the reason why I got involved in politics, Jennings Randolph has stood there like a stone wall. I mean, he will not, you know, public opinion can shift, but Jennings Randolph has not. In his entire career, I think, has been marked by uh, um, an attempt to get to average people uh, uh, minimal requirements and needs that all people have. So first of all, let me give you our quarterly magazine along with my business card because in the future, Senator, I will likely be contacting you. Randolph continually faced up to the politician's dilemma of balancing the general needs of the average voter, like those by the wayside of the road, with the specific interests of those who come to lobby him. The AT&T breakup has caused a lot of problems, and we'd like to get those solved as soon as possible for our customers and your constituents. You, you felt that, that people, that people sort of expect things to be done for them. Well, they have a right to expect it. Why shouldn't people expect that back in the state of West Virginia, we would have better roads? And the only way I can get the better roads is to hold the positions that I've held as chairman of the subcommittee on roads as chairman of the Subcommittee on Transportation, both in House and Senate. There's where I can have the impact so the coal miner can drive 60 miles back and forth to his job. Well, that's natural and proper and right. That was something he wanted people to remember in 1978. Running against former Republican Governor Arch Moore, he spent nearly $700,000 and, for the first time in all his years in politics, launched a major media campaign. Disaster relief and flood protection for southern West Virginia. $182 million more dollars for the Black Lung Program. A new medical school at Marshall. A new airport for Parkersburg and more. When you deliver like Randolph delivers, you don't have to promise anything. I, I was even thinking about my father when I marched down 
uh, Main Street in Clarksburg a few nights before the election in 1978. Mm. I realized that I was in a very tough race. And I was passing the golf building, which is next to the county courthouse, Harrison County. And uh, walking with me was my son, Jay Randolph, the sportscaster. And beside Jay was his son, Jay. And there the three of us were walking in the parade. But as I came by the golf building, which is next to the courthouse, why uh, nobody would know this, and it's not perhaps something I should say, but that's where my father's office was in the golf building as a lawyer. And I remember so well, I did this as a marked spy. So there are four generations where they're not really involved in that moment. Randolph was re-elected in 78 by fewer than 5,000 votes. But in 1980, the Republicans won the White House and the Senate. For the first time in his years in Congress, Jennings Randolph found himself a member of a minority. In 1981, a personal loss, when Mary died after a long battle with cancer. In September of 1982, Randolph cast his 10,000th vote, believed to be an all-time record for a member of Congress. 10,000 decisions through the years on matters big and small. Then in 1983, 50 years after he first came to the Congress, another decision. I would be approximately 83 years of age when I would be asking West Virginians to vote for me to remain in the Senate for six years, and I would be 89, bordering on 90 years of age. Now, I'm apparently in good health. I'm active. I do my work. I like the work, but I know I would not want to, in any sense, have them feel that I thought that, well, I'm a fixture on the hill, regardless of this and that. But with his announcement that he wouldn't seek re-election, Jennings Randolph lost one of the best allies he has had, time. It took 19 years to see the interstate highway system become law, and 25 years for the 18-year-old vote to become part of the Constitution. Even the National Air and Space Museum, a pet Randolph project that is now the most popular tourist attraction in Washington, was on his agenda for decades. And you had about 12 bulls, the, the chairman of, of each of the committees. Uh, it was like maybe a roulette. Sometimes you'd lose, but sometimes you'd win cleanly. But there would be action. And now there's kind of uh, uh, obstruction, there's kind of lethargy, there's kind of weariness that plagues the Senate enormously, and I can see Jen Jennings Randolph saying, uh, oh, for the good old days uh, when uh, we knew how to legislate. Unless we can condense it to 30 seconds to make the national news, um, it, is, uh, it is something that doesn't get focused. Um, consequently, it's, I think quite frankly, I don't mean this in any way to, um, to uh, disparage those tremendous efforts of Jennings, but I think it's harder to do it now, no matter who you are, than it was uh, 25 uh, and 30 years ago. You don't have anybody straggling in. It's my privilege this morning to introduce to you West Virginians. Being a West Virginian, a very proud moment for me, Senator Jennings Randolph. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, young ladies and young gentlemen. I'm going to take just I don't know how he keeps up the, the pace at 82, or I don't know how he kept it up when he was 75 or 70. He's the most remarkable man I know of. He doesn't smoke, he doesn't drink, he doesn't need much sleep, and he just loves to be with people, and he loves the challenge of doing what he's been doing for so many years. I believe in you. I believe in all of you who are here today. It was 1942 that I first introduced the legislation to give the right and the responsibility to young people, 18, 19, and 20, to vote in this country. He's an anachronism in a way, uh, and uh, 
Um, in another way, he's the conscience and soul of, uh, of my party. Thank you. <laughs> a man of joy himself and spirit and a very loving person. Thank you. Oh, I shook hands with you. He's a man that brought uh, uh, a lilt to the place and, and a great desire to hope that as we mash each other around in this place that we do it with still the thought in mind that we are civilized people. Uh, have you written me? Uh, I have uh, talked with you uh, last year when the dead. Uh, I remember. Was here. I do remember. Yeah. We'd really like for you to go on record as endorsing any of those bills. Well, we have, and I'm on many of them. All right. these uh, periods of history, our ups and our downs. Uh, something studying about this country. I'm not a pessimist, and I never am, but I am off, oftentimes concerned. And I uh, am concerned of the degree that I find myself not walking the floor at night, but I awaken. And something, I don't know how it comes to me, but the first thoughts I have, well, what about this country of ours? What about this America that you represent in part through the Senate seat you hold? And what can you do and what can we do there'll continue to be these problems. They'll pile up on us sometimes so rapidly that we, we just don't know what to do. But there's certain uh, sanity and spirit in America that I believe will, will see us through. The old saying is, chickens will come home to roost. And that is tradition where you travel the length and the beds of this great nation. Eventually, you come back we may have to turn many corners uh, in this period of time as we've turned them before, uh, but I believe that uh, the road ahead is is with all of its turning, its mark, and that's for an America to live. Thank you. 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 Thank you.